one we have is from Brett Cox. He is the co-founder of Cardinal Geospatial, and his presentation will be on raster tools and calculations for pre-app UAS planning. All right. Thanks, Jackie. Um, and uh, Jackie wouldn't say this, but uh, she's a good friend of my wife, and that's uh, how I, I got hooked up with it. So it's great to be here. Um, anyway, I'll uh, get to sharing my screen so we can get started here. And host disabled participant screen sharing, if we can get that. Uh, that might be a setting in the Zoom as well. I think maybe I need to get access to that Zoom account. I'm, I'm jumping in real quick. Okay, and, and thank see. you. Sleep, you can go to the top right of his photo and you'll get three little dots and then say make a host or something, make co-host. Let me see if I can do it. No, I think the yeah, or you or you would it. rather go to the down to the screen share and make it multiple because if you make him the host, he's gonna have full control of everything. It's gonna throw it off. <laughs> hey, we can't be doing worse power. if we let if we let okay, everybody okay. have all. Okay, so where do, where do I go? To go down to screen multiple. share. You should see a arrow. Hit that arrow and say multiple participants can share. There we go. All right, here we go. We got it. Oh. So, there you go. We, we should it. have it. We see yep. it. Yep. Excellent. Okay. So I'll uh, I'll try to be as concise as possible while still getting across everything that I wanted to get across. Um, but I have a tendency to be long-winded, but I will work really hard to, to uh, go against that. But uh, like Jackie said, um, I'm Brett Cox, and I'm a part of Cardinal Geospatial. Uh, we're a relatively new uh, we call ourselves a consortium of geospatial professionals. Uh, there are three of us that work in tandem together. Um, and uh, we have backgrounds in agriculture, UAS, remote sensing, environmental science, geology. If, uh, if it has to do with GIS, one of us has probably touched something like it before. And uh, we happen to be an AUVSI member as well, which is uh, uh, automated uh, vehicles, uh, including drones. Um, so we've kind of crafted a, uh, a niche in the conversion of, uh, in, in the, uh, the combination of GIS with, with drones. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And I think it's, uh, relevant to this group. I know there's a lot of, uh, government GIS professionals here. Um, and you, uh, probably have seen or, or heard of ta uh, talks, to bring drone operations into uh, some of your workflows and some of the things that uh, your local governments are doing or the state government is doing. Um, so hopefully this will help give you a little bit uh, of a well-rounded approach to uh, one aspect of how GIS and drones kind of intersect uh, whenever it comes to safety and pre-flight planning. But uh, here's the three people. I'm Brett, uh, Aiden uh, is joining on the call. Also, uh, I haven't seen if she's here, but I, I think she's going to be here. If she's not here now, she'll be here later. And then uh, our other colleague is uh, Cecily Heim. So over the next few minutes, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of one of the projects that we've done for uh, one of our clients um, in regards to drone safety. I'm going to define some variables, identify source uh, error sources uh, that have to do with uh, a uh, UAS in flight. Uh, as in regards to positioning and altitude. We're gonna create a conceptual framework of how to think about uh, the UAS as it's flying in the air uh, in its position and altitude. We're gonna identify questions about uh, what can GIS people on the front end whenever they're planning a flight, how can we uh, answer questions uh, using this framework and the tools that we have. And specifically uh, for this group, I'm gonna talk about some, a couple uh, ArcGIS tools and how they would be applied to this situation to solve those questions and, and answer, um, answer those safety questions up front. So hopefully by the time we leave uh, 
here in a few minutes, you're going to have a better understanding of the interplay between SUAS positioning, altitude, and elevation rasters. So that's uh, where the GIS is coming in. Uh, second thing, uh, hopefully you're going to understand the difference between raster calculations and focal statistics. 99% of you probably have used raster calculations and use them all the time. Uh, a little bit less focal statistics. Uh, that, As we came across that, that was not a new concept, but uh, an interesting uh, case study in how you can use focal statistics in this application and uh, how the ArcGIS raster tools can be used in SUAS operation planning. So let's get into it real quick, uh, an overview of the project. So generally, the idea of the project was uh, how do inherent errors and the interactions between the errors affect position and altitude and its uncertainty uh, with an SUAS in flight. So the, the, ca the case would be uh, we're trying to look at a model, whether it be a DEM, DSM, DTM, and we're trying to predict based on that model uh, what safety uh, issues might come up. And so one of the variables, obviously, in this interaction is the model itself that we're looking at to try to help uh, give us an idea of uh, what's going on on the ground and what are we going to have to deal with whenever the, the drone is in flight. And so the model is the variable. There are some errors uh, within the model itself. Of course, there's a Z error range, right, the elevation uh, of the model. And most of the time, these errors, uh, these error ranges are provided by the manufacturer of the model. Um, you can't uh, identify an error range on the back end, right? You have to know how the model was made. So a lot of times you're going to find those errors in the model provided, uh, you're going to have an error range provided by the manufacturer. And uh, cell size plays an integral role in determining you know, how much error uh, there can be. Generally, the larger the cell size, the more error there's going to be. Uh, the smaller the cell size, the less error and variability there will be inside of the cell, right? Uh, but cell, si cell size also uh, uh, interacts with the SUAS as it's in flight. The larger the cell size, the more likely you're going to be able to pinpoint down what cell you are actually in uh, whenever you uh, have the drone in flight and you're looking down onto the raster, looking down, on, down onto the raster more likely to know what cell you're actually in, as opposed to a small cell size, uh, which there could be more variability. You don't know exactly what cell you're in because the SUAS has XY uh, error, right? So the larger XY error, the more, uh, the more cells that it could possibly occupy <clears throat> uh, are present there. And of course, an uh, SUAS also has a Z error range. So we're starting to see how uh, errors are uh, interacting with one another and our uncertainty is starting to grow with where is the drone actually at whenever we're looking at it in reference to the raster that we're trying to use to plan. Um, and something that uh, drone people are really concerned with, uh, Transport Canada has kind of taken the lead on defining what these error ranges are for drone manufacturers because as you can imagine, they're not really forthcoming with what uh, their error is, right? But uh, they, they don't want to put themselves at a competitive disadvantage by being too transparent about it. But uh, with the Canadian government and Transport Canada, they do attest that they meet a certain threshold. So a lot of people are using that as uh, their minimum error ranges. And then something else that's kind of on the periphery uh, is the datum that uh, is being used. You want to make sure that the datum is consistent between the model and the SUAS. If they're not the same, then uh, you're going to obviously have a tremendous amount of error uh, because they're not reading off of the same script, essentially. Um, and so to, to get them in the same place, you might need to do conversions. And there are errors that, uh, that are added in whenever you convert from datum to datum. And so these are all errors that you have to uh, account for. And we won't even get into gravimetric and ellipsoidal and orthometric right now. That's too big of a topic to uh, discuss. But uh, the main takeaway here is that all three of these variables, um, they interact with one another and they compound on one another. So all these errors don't exist in a vacuum. And so whenever we're planning and we're using the model, uh, we have to make sure that we 
take that into account. And so in, in this uh, white paper that we did, we uh, came up with uh, a, a framework uh, to uh, define this error amalgamation. That was a big word uh, that I can't say, but uh, the convergence of all these errors together, uh, what kind of framework can we uh, look at? So if we're looking down on the drone um, from above, uh, you know, a bird's eye view onto the drone, you can kind of see what's going on we might have a drone that occupies uh, it. Re the reading that uh, it has is in between uh, cell A, B, C, and D in the middle. And of course, it has an X, Y uh, error that's represented by the red circle. And then uh, there might be some other type of positional error. It might be from the, the raster might have positional error. And so that uh, error is represented by the blue. So as you add error on top of error, uh, you eventually get bigger and bigger so that our area of uncertainty uh, begins to occupy a majority of, in this example, all four of these cells. So although the reading is in the middle of the four cells, um, in reality, that drone could be anywhere within that area of uncertainty. So um, that's, our, that's our X, Y. And of course, as we take this 3D, we start to see how that affects our uh, altitude uncertainty. So our positional uncertainty, X, Y, uh, that you see here on the right with the red circle, um, our drone could be anywhere in those four cells and there are huge differences between the four cells, right? Uh, like cell D on the right, uh, it's not labeled, but if you reference over to the left, is 20 meters, uh, has a reading of 20 meters, is significantly different than the reading of cell A that has a reading of 60 meters. Um, and so although the drone could be in cell D, uh, it also could be in cell A. So safety wise, uh, we would know that uh, we need to account if we want to uh, be absolutely sure that we're not going to encounter the ground, we have to be at least 60 meters plus any type of other uh, elevation inaccuracies or errors that we have, which might be uh, the DEM error range. So we're gonna add that on top of that. We have the altitude uh, error of the SUAS, so we're going to add that on top of that. So we start to see how all these errors compound on one another to make sure that we operate in a safe flight. So we have two buckets of accuracy. One is an alti uh, altitude accuracy. The second one is positional. And uh, the positional really affects altitude, which is what we're concerned with. So whenever we start to apply this in a GIS context, or context how, can, how can we as GIS people help uh, those drone people uh, create uh, tools uh, or scripts or uh, anything to uh, make sure that we plan properly um, to make sure that we're doing a safe flight? Uh, altitude accuracy, uh, really, there's your traditional raster calculator, right? We can take a raster, we can add in uh, any type of uh, very, uh, error constants on top of that raster to get uh, the reading that we need. Most of the time we're going to be adding error ranges on top so it raises the elevation uh, to uh, a safe amount, right? That we know that uh, it can't be more than this based on all the errors that we've identified. So that's, that's your vanilla um, raster calculator. The positional accuracy, however, uh, whenever it comes to raster uh, calculations is a little bit different. And so there's a tool uh, in uh, RGS uh, that Esri puts out called Focal Statistics. Now, uh, some of you have probably heard about it. Um, a lot of you probably haven't. And I have never had an opportunity to implement this before. So this was a, a fun uh, tool to learn. And the premise of it is, is uh, in your raster, uh, for every cell, a neighborhood around it is identified. So you can identify it in all sorts of different ways. You can identify it uh, by number of, you know, number of cells, the size of the window based on the cells. You can also define it um, as you project it based on uh, the size, uh, like you can define um, how many miles or how many feet. Uh, and then it'll draw a circle and use the uh, cells that intersect with that or fall completely within it. So there's all sorts of ways to define that neighborhood. And using the values in the neighborhood, a calculation is made to assign a new value to what I call the home cell, right? That cell that we were looking at that we used to define the neighborhood, 
we use the values in the neighborhood to make a calculation and a lot of it might be range mean sum, all sorts of different calculations that you can do to uh, provide a new value to that home cell and so what you get here uh, and the final is it iterates through every single cell in the raster and a new raster is created and so in this uh, circumstance uh, I symbolized uh, this raster uh, have I did the range uh, I did in this particular simple example I did the range and so on the right you have the range of the uh, neighborhood defined on the left and uh, we put a threshold on it. So anything that was five or above was considered uh, to be too high of a range. And I'll talk about that here in a second. So altitude, raster calculator, pretty easy. Positional accuracy and trying to identify how position affects altitude, uh, focal statistics. And so as we apply this framework, uh, there's uh, two low hanging fruits of possible questions to answer in regards to specifically how we uh, can improve the, uh, the safety of our drone operations. Uh, the first one is, where is there high, uh, where is there possibly high variability? So knowing, um, can we predict uh, with great certainty using this raster uh, that we know uh, what the level is at any given point, or is the land gonna be highly variable? Uh, and can we use focal statistics to do that? Uh, that would be uh, something that we can answer. The easiest one probably is what is the maximum possible elevation of any cell? And this would tell us we would build a new raster that's like this area cannot be any more, any higher than X. And so now we know that the drone has to fly. If it has a reading over that cell, it has to fly at least X or above to make sure that it doesn't uh, fall into a potentially hazardous zone. And so a workflow for this and the final results that we have um, based on this type of workflow is uh, you start with your altitude accuracy calculations, right? You do the simple calculations uh, to account for those vertical um, errors. You arrive to a new raster and then you move on to your positional uh, accuracy determined by focal statistics. And so as we apply to the two problems that we had before, if we're trying to talk about relative variability, uh, is this raster, is the land represented by this raster relatively flat or is it possibly undulating and we need to take extra safety precautions? Uh, we proposed uh, to the client that uh, they use the range of surrounding cells to uh, determine uh, relative variability, right? Low range would be low variability, relatively flat. Uh, raster that you have there uh, in, in, in juxtaposition to uh, high range values. Uh, high range values would indicate uh, very undulating terrain, uh, something that we need to take extra safety precautions whenever we're operating a real. And then uh, the low hanging fruit, a raster of maximum possible elevations. Um, you would take step one, you know, calculate all of your errors on top of the original raster and then uh, run a focal statistics and the neighborhood would be defined as your x y error uh, of the suas and then from there you can assign the maximum value of the neighborhood to that home cell and now you know if i get a reading within this cell it's not going to be over this uh, based on our positional uh, accuracy so i know that was a lot uh, but hopefully you got a little bit out of it two different tools uh, applying it into a new context. And uh, if there's any time for questions, uh, Aiden and I are happy to take them. Uh, and if there's not, that's fine. I uh, appreciate everyone's time listening and uh, welcoming me to the group here. Thanks so much, Greg. We actually do have one question that just came in and that's what's the best mid-range SUAS? Oh, I'll let Aiden hop in. I'm not a uh, I'm not a drone person. I'm the person that uh, helps with uh, helps with the data part of it. Uh, as far as operations, uh, I'm not sure. Aiden has a little bit more experience. Aiden, if you're there, you can hop in. 
Yeah, hi, I'm I I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, uh, we we both really are just more kind of the data folks. <laughs> um, but as far as I, I don't want to go and start recommending brands because I don't have the most experience as a you know being a pilot. Um, Kind of the typical brands that you see uh, regular. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the regular, the the most frequent brands you see are like uh, you see DJI a lot. Um, I know uh, Sensefly. I think they're local to this area. Um, draw, drawing a blank. There's there's definitely there's brands that are. Um, Pretty much anything that's uh, in the thousands is probably something that can collect good data. And then the little toy toy uh, drones are probably not going to collect the best um, collect the best data. Uh, there's lists. I think the Trans Canada um, has a list of drones that are um, that that are uh, fit the requirements for. Um, for data collection and the the requirements that I think Brett went into just a little bit about um, some of that flight error information, but yeah, I hope that kind of answers the question from a non drone hardware expert. Thank you so much. Um, we did have somebody say that you definitely get what you pay for, <laughs> and then That's somebody else, true. yeah, since Fly is international but has a local office in Raleigh, it's a fixed wing though and a bit more expensive than mid-range good product but closer to 10 grand so all right well thank you so much Brett, for the session very interesting yes um, thank you i appreciate and, and everyone great on time thank you yes, thank <laughs> so we'll go to the next uh session which is with sean mcknight and i do believe he is on the on the line and he's going to be doing keeping pace with utility assets the city of durham as built digital submittal program. And Sean is with the city of Durham as a GIS supervisor analyst. All right, thank you. Can you guys hear me? You're welcome. Okay. Uh, go ahead and set to share my screen, right? That's correct. There should be a little button there for you. Uh, okay. Yep, we've got it. Well, let's see. Okay, here we are. Hope everybody's doing well today. Um, Pretty like, good. Uh, Jackie said, my name's Sean McKnight. I am GIS analyst supervisor of the city of Durham. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we actually get our utility assets into our GIS. Um, so like I said, we work in public works, uh, Stormwater and GIS division. Our unit essentially kind of does all the heavy lifting with data entry. So annexation, city limits, roads, three utilities and our impervious area all go through our unit. And this little presentation is really about how we deal with just the utility information. Um, here's a little rundown of what we're dealing with right now. Um, water, sewer, stormwater. This is kind of the size of our system. Pretty good size for our area. A um, lot to keep track of for our group, but we've come up with a few good ways we think of dealing with this. Um, so I'm not sure how it works in other towns, but I suspect this is similar to how things are done. Essentially in, in Durham, we have this sort of uh, process you see up here on the screen. We review drawings that come in from private developers. The private developers actually build infrastructure. I mean, we have we certainly have capital improvement projects that we handle, but by and large, most of our utilities now are built in the private sector. Um, we inspect the construction, and then they submit to us as built. Um, at some point, we our GIS unit maps the infrastructure, and then the city goes through this process of formally adopting this infrastructure. So it becomes essentially owned by the city and maintained by the city. So here's our kind of the basic process. And I suspect, you know, most of us who do work in local government, this is kind of how it works. 
um, we're kind of here at the end of this process where things have been planned, things have been constructed. Now we're at the, what I call the closeout. We're getting in final documentation and, and as built is, is what we really deal with. And this is kind of the time at which we get involved most heavily because now we've got new infrastructure that we have to add to our GIS databases. So what we ended up doing was coming up with a implementation. This first started back in 2006, 2007. It was really pushed by the city engineer. Um, we, have a, we have a pretty good, or good as-built standard that was already paper and mylar based. The requirements were pretty, pretty well spelled out. So we had a good starting point. And all this stuff is housed in this guidebook that really developers work with when they build new projects in Durham. Um, so what we did is we came up with this kind of digital as-built standard. Um, we just wanted location, connectivity, attributes, kind of the standard things you would need. Um, this, <clears throat> this information is really requested when the developers are finalizing their their submittals to the city. And we wanted to try to automate this as much as possible um, because we know much of the process in the field and coming from engineers and developers is automated. And most of these things are digital, digital already. So we just wanted to take advantage of that. So our standard essentially involves these components. Um, we ask for a summary file of the project, which is really more or less what the project is and some control points. We ask for their CAD information. We ask for PDF files of their final <clears throat> um, plan and profile drawings of the, all the utilities and the streets in the project. And probably the most important thing that we're asking for is these, are these data files. And these are essentially the survey coordinates of all the infrastructure in the project. And that's really the thing that we focus on as, as, as the most important part of the submittal because that's the thing we can pull directly into the GIS. I think the one thing that we ended up doing is, you know, getting the submittal in place was one thing, but as we started building off of this, we realized we needed all the supporting um, technology, let's just say, or initiatives. Um, so we had, we realized we needed a way to track projects. We needed a way to track reviews because because we would be involved in reviews. Our GIS employees would be involved in reviews just as some of the engineers are involved with the reviews. Um, we, we ended up having, a, um, having some desire to track inspections on these projects. And we realized all this stuff was gonna change workflow, which is always really difficult, as I'm sure all of you know, when people are used to doing things one way and you gotta change it to do it another way. So we ended up with all these other supporting initiatives and, and some of these things, we ended up expanding to other units in our department. So every time we kind of built something, something else would kind of pop up that we, that was like some new idea because we built some new, we built some new way of doing something. So something else would come up. So the kind of the first thing that we had to deal with is what we call project tracking. And this is a way for us to say, hey, let's put a polygon around a new development. And if they're gonna add infrastructure, we wanna know about it. And essentially we put a polygon around it. We track things by phase because people wanna phase all their developments. Um, we use this also to track all our updating so we know you know, what's been updated and when it's been updated. And so it lets us know if things are missing. And we also provide links to drawings, um, the construction drawing, which is the proposed, the proposed infrastructure and the asphalt drawing when it comes in. And this has been nice for, nice throughout the city for folks to just reference because now they have a way of, you know, just looking at the map and pulling up drawings for an area they might be in, interested in. 
And it's been used in lots of other contexts as well. So we ended up hanging lots of other things off of this kind of basic layer. Um, we also end up building a database to track a lot of items, um, primarily our reviews. So we, like I said, our unit helps review the as built. So we really are involved in reviewing the digital portion of the as built that come in. Um, we've also kind of built on top of this to include um, inspections of the water and sewer, or I'm sorry, sewer and stormwater mains that are required now. And, and this, um, this whole bonding process, which is a complete mystery to me and ended up being really, really important <laughs> for our folks on our engineering side. Uh, that kind of ended up being something we and spend a lot of time working on as part of this whole process. Uh, one thing that was in place even before our digital standard was this um, plan profile database. So this is a database of existing plan and profile drawings that we really serve out to the public. These are public documents, so we have to serve them out. Um, this is in place and that was part of our, part of our digital submittal standard was to ask the developers to provide us with PDFs. So we wouldn't have to go through the process of, of really scanning all these documents we're getting in. So one thing that we ended up also building is this um, online map to check and verify and flag errors for the digital submittals that come in. So we're getting these digital data files in and so we we figured out a way we could build something that essentially takes their information, their surveyed information that people are providing us and essentially draws it on a, a map, kind of in a kind of in this loose graphical form. It just kind of tells us if things are right, it flags certain errors for us, and it and it allows us to have a conversation back and forth with an engineer or developer to, to um, inform them how correct the data that for setting this is. We've got an internal version for ourselves and an external version for any engineer and developer that submits these as built to the city. And the final part, probably our most interesting and fun part was the actual process of getting this data into our GIS. Um, essentially right now it's a Python script. It takes the digital information provided to us and just essentially does an automatic import, um, brings in all the XYZ locations of major features. It connects these features together with the mains or pipes and adds any necessary laterals and, and so forth that are needed automatically. Um, we use attribute assistant quite heavily now. So many of the things that we had to do by hand are almost fully automated at this point. So it's it's a fairly automatic process. Um, so a little summary of where we were and where we are. Um, like I said, we now participate in the ASBUILT process. Um, that helps essentially because if, if there's problems, we can address it before um, developers send us final copies of anything. Um, whereas before we had this kind of long lag time of adding new assets to our system, now we just add them right as soon as we get a good ASBIT, we can add that stuff into our system. Like I said, we have get these PDFs in uh, directly so we can make those available almost right away. Um, we used to digitize a lot, but now we just import. And instead of we instead of getting a bunch of projects all at once, now we now we kind of have a steady flow of projects every month. And the pressure to map things is, you know, pressure to map things in the past isn't as much because right now we can say, well, look, we know we can import this stuff pretty quickly. So if we want to pause and, and do some other work, it's not such a big problem. Um, some of the challenges right now we have, uh, we do have projects that just for some reason fall apart is what I call it, and things just don't work out. And so that totally screws up the whole process. Um, we do have rogue projects out there that are 
for some reason that we don't get as built for. Uh, we're still trying to figure that one out. So that's a continued challenge. And again, some projects fall through the cracks uh, for various reasons. We're still trying to plug some holes in, in various parts of the city with, with things that get done in different ways for some reason. <laughs> um, and then we got changes to phasing, which always messes us up. So somebody will rephase a project and we don't know about it. And everything we do is based upon phasing a project. So it's a, that's a continual problem. Uh, things that we're looking for in the future and changes to our program is uh, Arc Pro, of course, because we're gonna move that direction. Uh, I'm pretty sure this will work because we built this stuff in Python, so it should work. Uh, we have a, we're having requests to see infrastructure beforehand. So this is, this is, this is potentially pretty challenging. Um, they want it for bond calculations and our group and engineering inspections wants to see this. So we're still trying to figure out if this can be done. Um, the databases that we use, we, we want to push them to the web at some point. That's an obvious one. And we'd like to continue to push these requirements to all projects because we, like I said, we have projects that do still fall through the cracks. And so we'd like to get that work out. Uh, I guess um, that's about it. And I'm waiting for questions, if anybody has any. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Y'all are doing great with this timing, trying to make up for that, that front loaded. <laughs> So um, currently we do not have any questions, but I did have one question for you. And I could you touch on your QC process with the automated import of as built and the asset and the um... uh, yeah, we we QC things initially when we do the reviews and then um, afterwards we we are using data reviewer to do much more thorough QC after the fact. And, I, and it's, it's good that you asked that because, because the importing and, and the process is so automated, it's easier for people to, it's easier for people to make mistakes because sometimes, sometimes things don't come in so perfect and, it, mm -hmm. and it's easy to get dependent upon that import. And then people don't realize they're making mistakes. Um, and so we've we found that um, we've had to rely on additional QC, mainly, like I said, data reviewer at the end of the process. Yeah, especially when you're relying on CAD drawings to 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 be accurate as far as snapping and. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Uh, the big pro the one problem we see that we continue to make is people will accidentally import something twice. Ah. And so you're putting a feature right on top of a feature. You yeah. can't even see it. Can't see it. Yeah, so. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Um, so we have a question from Patty Dukes. It was, was the Python script done in, in-house or from Esri? <laughs> oh, in-house, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we built that ourselves. Uh, and again, we're essentially taking text files and importing, importing them directly. So it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's more about catching errors in the import process. And uh, then we have another question. Did you have to customize attribute assistant? Uh, oh yeah. I mean, we had to, in the sense that we had to, you know, do the standard, uh, the creation of the, what they call the dynamic value table. I don't, if you're familiar with it, you have a table that tells you Every single attribute that you want to you want to automate, then yeah, we had to do quite a bit of that, okay. and uh, that that was pretty tedious. But once you get it done, it's okay. Then it's isn't when you got a three utilities and hundreds of attributes, it's quite a task to start. But once you get it going, then it's not so bad. And does attribute assistant uh, assistant port over to Pro? <laughs> that might be. Uh, I don't know. I don't use Pro. <laughs> you haven't got that. Yet. That might be a Jay Fowler question. I, I, I hope it does. Uh, another question is, how is the public able to communicate with public works and other departments about utility issues within Durham? 
Oh, um, usually through our engineering department. It depends on what that what level that is. Like if you want to know, do I have water sewer on my parcel that I want to buy? That's an engineering question. If it's an engineer or developer, they can talk to our group directly if they want to look at utility data and that sort of thing. And then uh, it, so in pro it's known as rules. It's different. Um, that was of course Catherine yeah. Clifton and um, Jay did put a link there for you. And you did have a kudos from Carl Simmons. And I want to say uh, he said that he's worked with you in the past and this suite of tools saves literally, literally days of work. That's Carl Stearns. Stern, <laughs> Simmons. <laughs> Carl, okay. yes. yep. Carl was instrumental in getting this whole thing working. So thank you, Carl. Um, appreciate yeah. it. So thank you for your presentation. It was awesome. And uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next presentation that we have. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, we have Julie Davidson with Agri Waste Technologies, Inc. Right out of Apex. She's a senior GIS analyst with them. And her presentation is, I can't sell my home until my wastewater system is permitted <laughs> using EIS to change policy. Hi, Julie. Hey, how are you? Good. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Uh, it's, not, it's kind of a mouthful. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Sean, if you could just hit that uh, share screen again so we can get Julie to do hers. All right, can, is that working okay? I'm still seeing the the Durham one. Oh, okay. So let's share. see if what happens if I share. Are you able to hit that button and share? There yeah, you go. There you you go. see it? Okay, good. Yeah, we're Finally good. got it. Great. Okay, so I can't sell my house until my septic system is permitted using GIS to change policy. As um, Jackie was just saying, my name is Julie Davidson and I'm a senior GIS analyst for Agri Waste Technology. And we do projects, we designed um, on-site wastewater systems and we inspect septic systems, um, well inspections, um, very poop centric we are. Um, we work in agriculture also and help uh, producers with their manure and their land application. And uh, so we, Lots of poop jokes. I can tell you that the funniest, the largest laugh I ever got was when my my son was four or five years old and he asked me what I did for a living and I told him I worked in poop and he thought that was the best thing ever. So that was pretty good. So, but um, today I wanted to talk to you about a situation that we had with um, homeowners in the Falls watershed area in Durham, North Carolina and a big challenge that they had to deal with. And I thought maybe it would be an interesting presentation for you guys today. So allow me to set the stage for you a little bit. So imagine you're a homeowner and you're re ready to sell your home. So, you know, right now the housing market is just crazy. I get phone calls and literal knocks on my doors from realtors wanting me to sell my house. It's insane right now. And that's a true story. <laughs> And so, but you're ready to sell your house and you're in Durham, the Falls watershed, and you follow your checklist. You know, you're, you've painted, you changed your countertops, you know, you've decluttered all that stuff you're supposed to do. And then you find a buyer and then perhaps maybe the buyer um, hired someone like AgriWaste, hired us to come do a septic inspection for, for your home or for the home. Yeah, for your home. And so the realtor comes back to you and she's really, really concerned. And she tells you that oh, you have an unpermitted sand filter discharge system. Oh, and really it's that serious. People freak out when there's anything having to do with septic systems and anything with an advanced septic system is even worse. So it gets really kind of crazy. So what is a sand filter discharge system? Well, we like to think about it as being um, a wastewater treatment plant in your backyard. You know, it's very, it's very straightforward. The waste is treated, it's disinfected, um, it's treated, and then it goes to the sand filter, and then it's disinfected and just discharged into a ditch or a stream. It doesn't have to be a surface water, but it's just discharged. 
And in the Falls watershed area, there are tons of these sand filter systems because it's located in the Triassic Basin. And the Triassic is the soil is terrible. It doesn't drain and it's very difficult to work with. So that's why you see a lot of these advanced systems. So when we have clients that come to us and they're having, uh, they need a permit for their for their septic system, we do, we go through the whole process of getting them a general discharge permit. And a general discharge permit is, it's an umbrella, it's a, it's a large uh, certificate of coverage. So it covers a lot of circumstances and a lot of situations that homeowners may have. And um, we've done this for many years and the general discharge permit permitting process was pretty straightforward. You're still going, going through your due diligence. Um, everything has to be de designed as state and government requirements uh, need you to. So um, the general discharge permit is generally your, your course of, of action. And But why is it important to have a permitted septic system? Um, it's important because when you have it permitted, it's showing that you have it's been designed appropriately, it's been uh, installed appropriately, and it's also helpful you know, for the environment and knowing that the due diligence has been covered for that particular system. And once you have it permitted, it becomes public record. And so if you have neighbors or as your home sells over and over, everyone will know where your septic system is located because they may have to install a well, or they may have to install a septic system. So it actually does affect your neighbors and the environment around you. So what's the big deal? Just get, get the system permitted. But the big deal is, I guess you can imagine money, of course, but in 2018, the general permit requirements changed specifically for these discharge systems. And the language changed to include high quality water areas. So this means that general, the general permit would not apply to residents with discharge sand filter systems if the discharge was going towards high quality water. So if you can't get a general permit, which is generally the way to go, the other option would be to get an individual discharge permit. Well, an individual discharge permit is very costly. In fact, it could cost even more than the house itself. It's very difficult to obtain. It takes a really long time to get to actually get the, the individual permit. And so rolling that price into the cost of the home is, is just not an option. And because you're in the Falls watershed, then you have to follow the Falls Lake nutrient strategy. And this sets nitrogen limits for the discharge and it's very strict nitrogen limits. And it's actually the same limits as they hold municipalities. So this isn't really, um, you can't compare residential waste systems to municipality waste systems. It's kind of like apples to oranges. It doesn't work very easily at all actually. So then you have this situation, the homeowners had this catch 22 where you have an unpermitted sand filter discharge system that would drain into high quality water. However, it can't meet the nitrogen requirements from the falls nutrient strategy. And so the individual permit requirements is not an option. And so then the homeowner still has an unpermitted wastewater system. And I can tell you from experience, when people learn that they have septic systems, they often, they will just close, they won't even buy the house. They are, are so afraid of it. So you can imagine how difficult this was for homeowners who are ready to move forward and to ready to move on, or maybe they're trying to close an estate or it just really left them in limbo. And so um, here comes a GIS part finally, right? So. I was asked to do to look at this closer in GIS and see if we could figure out, you know, see how many people this may impact or what did this look like for Durham County. And so that's where I did a wetland and a water delineation using Arc Hydro. And I like you can using Arc Hydro. I feel like it gives me a little bit more accurate results. You know, Arc Map has the hydrology tool set. You can use that also too, but I like creating the models and using Arc Hydro. So I did that. I had my work area here and I 
used a DEM in the grid format. And I did a little data manipulation, filled the sinks, prepared the DEM for my actual uh, delineation, because ultimately I need to figure out where my sh um, stream drainage lines were. And thanks to Arc Hydro, through the terrain processing, I was able to determine where those uh, actual drain lines or stream lines were actually in my, in my, my project area. And once I had that, I was able to check everything with a high quality water layer from North Carolina DEQ stream classification layer. And that's what the red layer is on top of my streamlines, my drainage lines. And it was easy to see at that point where my mouth or my pore point was gonna be from my high quality water area. And then I was able to get my um, high quality water high quality watershed delineation here. So now I finally have my project area that I was working with. And then thanks to Durham County, they provided, because it's public information, they provi provided a spreadsheet with all of the locations of the sand filter um, systems in Durham County. So that's what all these yellow points are. So ultimately I have a map here that showed what we have in my high quality watershed. You can see that there are 107 total discharge systems with 24 of them unpermitted. And this list is, is a bit evolving in that as systems are discovered when they fail or when homes are sold, then these, will, these numbers will tweak. So this isn't the end all be all, but it is a good idea to see what we have in relation to the entire falls watershed. So the falls watershed is the yellow highlighted here. And the area that we're talking about, the high quality watershed area is a small area in the north part of Durham. And so in the big picture, there are over a thousand sand filter systems in Durham in the falls watershed. But what we were looking at the high quality water area was a really small piece. So the question is, did we change policy? Did GIS change policy? Well, in 2020, they, they released a new general discharge permit and the permit no longer said high quality water would not be allowed. Discharge to high quality water wasn't allowed. And so I don't know that we actually changed the policy. However, I do know that we did talk to the government agencies and we shared this information with homeowners and we had it on our website and we definitely let everyone see what we found because it was putting a lot of homeowners in just a very um, a challenging situation for sure. Um, especially if you have a system that is failing, you want to have that repaired and you want to have it repaired properly and have it documented properly and having that high quality water statement in the general discharge permit was preventing even that from happening. So this is all evolving as we know policy changes and there's actually a study work right now going on with ECU, which you may know, and they're doing, they're researching how septic systems affect the environment. Specifically, they're taking uh, data and testing water and seeing if they can figure out what impact you know, all different types of septic system systems in North Carolina, how it is affecting. And they put the first draft, they published it earlier this year. So it'll be interesting to see how this changes and what we will learn as time goes. So, and it'll be also interesting to see how it changes um, work for agri waste also. So I totally blew through that. That was very fast, sorry. <laughs> you guys have any Thank questions? Thank you so much. No, that's great. I don't see any questions coming in, but it was a very thorough, uh, interesting topic of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. So the next session we have is, and this, this was a presentation at the NCGIS conference. It was really, I was able to attend it. So it was very interesting. Kelly Doss with the city of Durham. She's a GIS analyst with the Technology Solutions Department. And her session is utilizing the ArcGIS Special Events Permitting Solution in the City of Durham. 
So mm -hmm. Kelly's online. Take it away. There you Good go. Afternoon, everyone. Do a mic check. You can hear me. We can hear you good. All right. And um, I'm uh, the name is the same as my NCGIS uh, presentation, but this is going to be slightly different. I just wasn't quite sure how I was going to tailor it at the time. Uh, but I'm going to focus instead of going through the special events permitting solution, I'm going to more focus on uh, the takeaways from it that I think you can use um, not only if you just choose to use the solution, but also in other um, applications that you're going to be um, that you might use. I'm going to stop sharing my video. I tend to blip. I just wanted to show everybody my face. Um, okay, so what I'm going to focus on is um, the uh, use of hub. And then we used um, Integromat with Survey123 to do some web hooks and send some emails. Um, and then sending how to send emails um, via your web apps using pop-ups and expressions. And then also, because it was brought up at NCGIS, um, I reached out to Esri and I wanted to talk about um, taking payments um, using ArcGIS online. Um, so <clears throat> with your hub sites, um, a hub site is a tailored website that has pages to share information, and um, it's just a website that is meant to um, use your ArcGIS online account or um, an enterprise. It does have, you can do sites on um, portal, but it doesn't quite work the same as hub. But specifically, I want to talk about hub premium, because with hub premium, you get a, um, com a hub community account, and that comes with followers. And um, with that, you can um, you have external users contribute and edit data um, within your organization. And so for special events, how this was used is we wanted the, the public event organizers to, if they wanted to, to be able to create their own sitemap um, using um, ArcGIS and use that for their planning and um, sort of be able to do that ahead of being able to submit a permit application. So we set up um, the hub site and that's what we're actually using for our special events website now. And event organizers can uh, follow the site when you just call it registering and they create their own community um, hub account. And then they, by putting, when you deploy the solution, it gets a followers group with it. And that works just like any other group in ArcGIS online. And if you put items in that followers group, then um, the people who register for that initiative for your hub um, can access those. And so the event organizers can go in and build an event site map and they can submit a preliminary application if they're just gonna be using it for planning. So that is one thing I wanted to note. And um, you and those, the within the hub site, those pages are um, how you do this and your pages are content items that will show up in your content in ArcGIS Online. And so they can be restricted to the followers group or you can do it to your internal users um, just by keeping that content item private and then sharing it to the groups that you need. Um, so this top is our uh, just a section of our hub site. And this is where the event organizers can register. So without registering, you know, in the upper right, you just see it still says sign in. Um, if they click on that event organizer page, it just says you need to sign into ArcGIS Online. But once they register and have them signed in, they then, they click, then click on that event organizer page and it'll give them links to the preliminary application and to be able to create an event sitemap into a um, event dashboard that I created. And then I also wanted to point out after I sort of learned about um, Hub and how the pages can work and how you can do external or um, users, um, we were contacted by UNC. Um, we are doing, a, there's a city, county, UNC initiative called Back on the Bull, um, which is a part of what they were doing is sending UNC interns out to do a survey about um, the COVID guidelines that businesses were following. And they wanted a way to um, track the locations that they had visited and update whether that business had completed their survey or not. And what I ended up doing is just very quickly creating a hub initiative for them. 
um, and the interns were able to, we didn't have to give all of them licenses. They were each able to create a hub community account and they have access to a field maps mobile app um, where they can go in and see all of the locations that they've been to um, and then edit as they need to um, what the status of that, that survey is. And then there's also, they do have one um, internal that we gave them one license since it's just a temporary thing. And there's an executive team dashboard that they can log into. And that was because initially they didn't want the interns to be able to edit. They wanted to be edit internally. So just wanted to point out that it, um, the hub site, it has, you know, if you need to have external users contributing and editing, that is a great way to do it. Um, for Integromat, one of the things um, in the special events, the old system that we used when a survey was submitted or when a permit application was submitted, um, the Civic Plus, our website content manager, would email um, people letting them know that an uh, application had been submitted. And so we wanted to do, have that same functionality within the solution and looked into using Integromat as it's um, one of the vendors that is integrated with survey one, two, three, um, Microsoft flow being another one. And so for survey one, two, three, um, Integromat can either watch for new or updated surveys, um, or you can create port reports from a survey. And we are actually using both of those functions for our, um, for our application. And and within Integromat, there's a variety of actions that you can do, and there's integration with a lot of other apps using modules. Um, Survey123 is just one of hundreds of applications. Um, the free version, which is what we're using, and we're sort of using it as testing to see if Integromat could be an enterprise-wide solution um, for webhooks. Um, the free version allows two active scenarios at a time, and you can do 1,000 actions per month. Within special events permitting, um, first thing we're using it for is when a new permit application is submitted, an email is sent to an in, the internal team using um, Microsoft 365, and that's the module that was used. And then also um, when that is submitted, a PDF copy of that permit application is sent to the event organizer um, to the email that they included in their permit application. And then we also um, have, if they want to create a site map ahead of time and create a, a preliminary application, we also have a draft email that is created if um, they choose to do that. It's created in our permit manager's um, email account so that when they actually choose to uh, fill out a full permit application, they just let her know and she can send that draft email and then the sort of the process starts over with, they just submitted a new permit application. Um, one thing I wanted to note, we rolled this out um, January 1st. We have had three log incidents um, where this sort of the uh, system failed and emails weren't sent. Uh, one of them was just a uh, was logged as a timeout and it eventually resolved itself after trying to resend. Um, one of them just this week, earlier this week, we had a, a system-wide Microsoft 365 connection issue. And so any permits applications that were submitted earlier this week, um, these emails weren't sent. And then something that I wasn't quite able to figure out where the, a filter failed in going from survey one, two, three to Microsoft 365, but that also has resolved itself and has not repeated since that happened. Um, Integromat works, you know, it sort of set up a lot like model builder, if you're familiar with that, it's just modules that you add and um, a lot of drag and drop. And so I wanted to show you, this is a, they call them scenarios. So this is uh, the scenario for when a new permit application is submitted. So the first is survey one, two, three. It, you can do a watch survey. It's either looking for new surveys or updated surveys. So I chose to do both um, because we also have that preliminary. So when that preliminary application gets changed to submitted, the same process starts again. Um, so from survey one, two, three, it watches for a new or updated where the status is submitted. And that's what that filter is um, in the connector. That goes to Microsoft 365 and that creates and um, And then for the um, router, those both are doing the same things. Um, those um, two different scenarios um, there. And one is just for when it's a new scenario or a new permit application and one's for when it's updated. 
but it's um, creating a PDF report. The HTTP module just saves a temporary copy of that report and then it's inserted as an attachment into an email that goes out. And these are the, um, the back end of how you set those up. So the first one is setting up that filter. This sort of shows you that it's, you, it shows all of the things that are behind that survey. So to get the status where the status is submitted, I just went to you know, where the feature attributes are and set up a filter of where status is equal to submitted. And that's how that um, works. And I had had no experience with any of this before I started doing this and it, I did find it very easy. And then for setting up your email, it just sets up where you put the connection. Um, I did set this up on my computer. So I did need to go in after the fact and remote into um, Rosemary Kearney. She's the permit manager for special events um, and actually we just set that up so that it was sent from her email account. Um, but then you, yeah, you can just add the subject that you want, the body content, you can pull in a specific attributes and put your recipients and then um, once that is submitted, it automatically sends that email. And then same for that creating reports. Just wanted to show how that is on the back end where you put that in. I did find where you, um, the file that it needs to save. So later, if you watch this video, you can see which one you would need to use if you wanted to um, do this. Um, but yeah, again, I just found it, it was pretty easy to set up. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is sending emails via the web apps using pop-ups and expressions. So included in the special events permit, permit manager web app are all these pop-ups and expressions where you can have an email set up at the touch of a, at the click of a button. Um, and to set those up, I found that you could easily just copy and paste the HTML source code in that pop-up and um, copy and paste the expressions that you need and then edit those as needed. And that's a good way to do that yourself, to edit, to customize, to extend. Um, and just one thing I wanted to point out when I did this, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here in a minute, is when you're clicking on it, I when we first set it up, um, my laptop was defaulted to the Windows Mail email program. So in order for it to work correctly, we did have to go in and change the default email settings all over to Microsoft Outlook. This is one thing to point out. Um, and then the background here is the, the permit manager and that's um, set up as the crowdsource manager template. But on the bottom left, you can see this is the sort of the pop up I wanted to point out. You have where depending on the status, um, the color changes across the board. And then you also have these buttons that you can push where you can bring up the permit application, you can bring up with the site map, or you can notify people. And then in the sort of middle um, window there is all the various expressions that um, come included with the solution. I would have no idea how to ever have written these myself. So this is one of the great things about solutions is Esri has done a lot of this for you. And then you can just customize as needed. Um, you can take this and use this in other applications that you need. So that's why I wanted to point this out. Um, so there's the various expressions. And then on the right is actually what the um, pop-up looks like in the web map in the background. So all the various buttons that are available depending on what the status is. So as that status changes, different buttons will show up. So this is just part of the HTML source code that's in the background of one of those. Um, and this is where you, I was able to go in and just copy and paste in sections of source code of the tables and then just edit the title and the expression that I needed um, so I was able to actually add, I'll go back. Um, so in the list of, in, on the right, all of the buttons, just the first five buttons were included with solution. And the last three, the notify organize, organizer if an application is approved, denied, or if more info is required, those are buttons um, that I've added in emails that I've added in and customized. So this just shows how you can, um, modify it in the background using that HTML source code. And again, I don't have, I really don't have a background in HTML. I just know enough about it that I can look at this and sort of say, okay, this is what this does. And, and then this is the email that comes up 
um, when you click one of those buttons. So this is the notify reviewers button and all this is set out in the background to just pre-populate. So this opens up on Rose's computer when she clicks that button and she just clicks send and that goes out to, to that whole group. And then this is the um, arcade expression behind that, that button and this is what um, makes that happen. And so, and this is what's great in those solutions again is even if you're not gonna use the solution, it's good to look around and try the demos of various solutions that you think you might be interested in just to see if there's any particular functionality within them that you really like. And then you can deploy that solution, go in and copy out that um, functionality and then um, modify it as needed in your other apps. And this is uh, sort of what I wanted to point out is this is our CIP project viewer that I've been working on. And um, I had looked before we started, before I built this, and looked at um, the capital project solution and um, they decided not to go with that. But in looking at it, I did see this little phase information table again, where as you, the phase changes, um, the, it goes along the, and changes the color. And so I just pulled that out of that um, solution and added it in here and um, modified it as I needed for our phase categories. And then finally, um, because they touched on it, I reached out to Esri. Uh, for our special events permitting, there's not a specific permit fee that we collect. So um, we don't have a way of paying. We just put links in our special event guidelines that's included on the hub site to the various, um, depending on if you're gonna be renting a facility or if you need a police officer, sort of depending on the situation, um, there the various pay sites that were already set up and the established procedures. But I reached out to um, Jay, who's on the call, and to Jeremiah um, at Esri, who was on the special events team, to ask them sort of what people were doing. They said if, to do it um, in special events, they have included some fields in the database schema they use for payments in case you wanted to set this up. But you need to use APIs. And using APIs, you can integrate the survey with the payment system. Um, it can provide a really nice user experience, but requires a fair amount of work to set up the integration. Um, and it adds a new piece to manage going forward. Um, there, it depends, there's a variety of payment systems. So it's gonna, depending on what you wanna use, it's gonna be a whole different setup. Um, and then there's also, and this is sort of, I touched on it, there's the complexity of multiple fees. So, you know, we have something if you want fireworks, if you're gonna have alcohol, you know, it's, it's, it's a variety of fees. Um, and then something that obviously brought up is you can just go with another vendor altogether, such as CityWorks. CityWorks is set up to take payments. So you wouldn't use Esri's um, survey, you would just set something up in CityWorks, but then that can be um, shown as a feature layer. So. All right, yeah, I sort of blew through that quickly, uh, but yes, any questions? And not, thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Kelly. I don't see any questions as of right now, but if anybody's thinking of, you know, questions after these presentations, if you want to put them in the chat still and we can we can connect you with the people that are presenting or they do have their contact information as well. I'm sure they don't mind you reaching out. So up next, we have Scott Black with Mecklenburg Park County. He's a GIS analyst programmer. His session is design and implement implementation of Mecklenburg County Park Explorer application using Esri Web App Builder. So Scott, if you're on here, take it away. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So let me just get everything going here. It's this one. We see it. You do see it. Okay, excellent. So what, um, what I'm gonna be talking about is, as Julie, as Jackie said, the implementation of the Mecklenburg County Park Explorer. And I just wanna introduce myself. Um, my name is Scott Black. I'm a GIS analyst with Mecklenburg County. I've been employed with Mecklenburg County since 2001. And so I'm gonna move into the presentation and hopefully this will be interesting. 
So the, one of my main responsibilities with Mecklenburg County GIS is management of park data in Mecklenburg County. And Mecklenburg County came to me with a request for a park finder application with a completion date to coincide with the release of their website redesign. The application needed to be able to do a few things for citizens. It had to help find a park by name or by using a proximity search around a user's home address. It had to provide turn by turn directions to a park and it had to find a park by a recreation amenity, AKA if someone is just looking for parks that has basketball field, basketball courts or baseball fields. Along with the public facing application, I developed an internal application to assist with editing park amenity data. I'll talk more about this later in the presentation. And to build this application, I actually used one of ArcGIS's deployable solutions called Park Finder as my starting point, which was a great asset. So the existing park data that we have or that we had, which has now been modified, had your normal information in it. It had name, address, park type, phone, uh, park region, that type of information, but it didn't have any of the attributes that I needed for the near me widget to work and use inside the application. So I needed to add a bunch of information to the existing park data to take advantage of the near me widget, which this near me widget is a piece of the park finder deployable solution. And we'll see that soon enough. So the attributes that I needed to add to our existing park data for in order to make use of the near me widget were Boolean attributes for all recreation amenities offered. Just a simple yes, no. So if it's restroom available, yes, no. Basketball courts available, yes, no. I needed to add attributes for each park's operational days and hours. I needed to add a website URL for each park. And this was important for two reasons. One, to direct people to the correct park agency since we were doing all of Mecklenburg County. And number two, to also direct them to the reservation portal for each of these park agencies for reservable facilities within the parks. I also added a picture of each park, um, not totally necessary, but I think worth the extra minute to capture these. I needed to set editor tracking on the data and global IDs. Um, finally, I needed to concatenate the park address with city, state, and zip code, so the Google API would find the correct location. I found in some testing before I had concatenated the address that there were several addresses across the country that were the same as addresses in Mecklenburg County. So this was in testing, I found that I needed to go through and make sure that all of my addresses pointed directly to Mecklenburg County. And also I added a managed by column, and this was really for the back end piece so that departments, other park departments in Mecklenburg County could only edit their data on the back end application. So the next piece that I had to do was I needed to build a recreation amenity database. This was data that we, park and recreation didn't currently collect. And so what we did was basically heads up digitized using the latest aerial. We collected recreation amenities for each amenity in the system. And it's just a point file over each tennis court, parking lot, restroom, shelter, horseshoe, you name it, there's, there's a point for it. Um, and so we had to do a little bit of field work testing um, or field work just for areas where we had heavy tree canopy, where the aerials just didn't quite allow us, even though they were leaf off, to see what's under there. So, but 99% of this was captured in the office. Then within this recreation amenity database contains over 2000 records. Um, we had, I had to set up a lot of domains just to ensure data integrity editor tracking and global IDs. Um, there, everything is set up in unique recreation types, which are then grouped into amenity types. And this is just for really ease of display inside AGOL and also on the editing application on the back end. The recreation amenity data are 
set up in specific attribute types, meaning courts, fields, shelters, playgrounds, aquatic and recreation centers. So you can go in and filter easily and see every single court in Mecklenburg County. You can see every single field in Mecklenburg County. And then you can further sort that by just baseball fields versus softball fields. And this work to achieve two, two different dynamic purposes. One, it makes it easy for park and recreation to now quantify what they have in the park system for all of Mecklenburg County, including all parks departments, or just for Mecklenburg County or each individual park depart parks department, say Cornelius, Davidson, Huntersville, can see what they have inside their system. And this is usually good reporting for TPL, which does a lot of recreational reporting across the country. And this also allowed, like I said before, them to filter the data for editing purposes so that Cornelius isn't editing Mecklenburg County data and vice versa. I, once we had the recreation amenity database built, we needed icons. And these icons were gonna be displayed inside the application. So I went to one of the designers within Park and Recreation, she's a graphic designer, and we worked together to come up with a whole host of unique icons for each amenity in the Park and Recreation departments for Mecklenburg County. All the icons we created are in PNG format, so they work well in both ArcGIS Pro and AGOL. The last big piece of the project was a little bit more data development and that was our disc golf courses. And this was done using an R2 GNSS receiver and attribution was done in the field. Um, I collected each tee, each basket and walked each fairway. And the way that I walked each fairway is if I would throw the course. And since I played disc golf, I just kind of walked it, then the best route in which I would take to go from the tee to the basket. So it's very personalized data. The data, all of this data is housed and managed on enterprise data servers. So I am pretty much the only one that edits 99% of this data with the exception of the Nature Preserve Trails. Everything else is edited uh, by myself. And so I have it all on enterprise data servers. I do all of the editing there inside and edit um, server and then push all of the feature classes out to production. You know, after all the edits are confirmed and I make sure everything's correct. I build all the map services and feature services from the data on our SDE and store the services on ArcGIS server, then consume them in AGOL. Um, any edits that I make in the application usually show up same day, but no later than 24 hours later. And this process seems to streamline the workflow and it works really well with keeping the application up and running. The data capture and after the data capture and massaging the existing data, the bulk of the work was completed in AGOL, um, either in the web map or in the application with the use of arcade expressions and HTML. This is one of the, this is the final look for Kilbourne Park in the web map with examples of some of the expressions in HTML used. Once I got into the application, it was really just a matter of setting up the near me widget, setting the search settings for parks, addresses, et cetera, setting up the symbology settings with a yes value for all recreation. This way the amenity icons would display in the near me widget if it existed in the park. If it did not exist in the park, it would not show up in the pop-up for the near me and setting the proximity search and defining the limits. So if someone puts in their address, which is ideally the way that it would work, you would put in your street address because not very many people are gonna know the name of a park, but if you do, you can search on that specific name. But if not, you put in your address and you hit enter and it, the application will go to your address and then give you the parks within one to a five mile search radius from your location. I have the max set at five miles simply because the way Mecklenburg County is designed, if you go any further than five miles, you're searching pretty much the whole county. 
Um, everything that is outlined in red on the screen is specifically coming from the park pop-up configuration in the web map. So that you can change really easily and it's not um, tied to the near me pop-up widget. So um, what's next for this? Well, a few things. One, the Greenway, I wanna make the Greenway trail data sets that we have in Mecklenburg County searchable. Right now that data set is broken out by individual segments based on whether it's gravel, concrete, wood, or asphalt. So I just need to group all those together, dissolve those, and just kind of create an, a, a dumbed down data set that I can use inside the application just for people to search on a specific greenway and get the whole greenway passed back to them. Right now I have greenway entrances in the application, but those aren't searchable. So that would be one thing that I may try to include as well. Nature Preserve Drill data set is another one that is not really searchable at this point, simply because of the way all the trails are segmented based on different variables that Nature Preserve put on trails. Like if a trail can be used for horseback versus pedestrian and so forth. Right now, the maintenance is really quick and easy on this. Um, I have edit and maintenance parts set up so that I handle all geometry changes and then a select few park staff from each department within Mecklenburg County handles attribute changes on the amenity side. And on the park side itself, I handle all the changes there. Um, and so I guess without, let's just take a look at the Park Explorer application and you can kind of see what it looks like. Let's see. Find it. All right. So this is what the application actually looks like once developed and working properly. And the way we have it actually up on our GIS server. So we don't, anytime I have to do any kind of Editing as far as HTML or anything, we don't have to do anything with this, this application because everything is coming from the REST services. So anything I do on the back end gets fed directly into the application. The only time that I ever have to repost the application back to ArcGIS server is if I make some kind of structural change, functionality change that will not pass through the REST service. So just for an example, if a person searches for an address, and this may be a little bit slow, live demos always fail, don't they? It's still thinking, it's getting there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, while we're waiting on that, if you want, if this is towards the end of your presentation, I do have a few questions. Oh, here we go. Something's happening. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, one question is, how did you capture the data for the disc golf courses within the application? Did you estimate to get the data from some or get the data from somewhere. So what I did is after GPSing the data, the data itself, I created a feature service layer out of each one of the data sets. And I'm pulling those into the application through the same ArcGIS server where I'm pulling in the amenity database, the parks and the greenways. So what we see is if we go in and just do an address, 
sends us to that particular address. And then it shows me how which parks are within a, right now just a one mile radius is what I'm searching for. And it gives me a list of parks and I can click on any one of those parks. And if I do that, it will zoom me straight to that park and then it'll show up with information in the pop-up. And it's running a bit slow, but that's probably just because of everything that we're going through here with Zoom and everything. And so what it will give us, it shows us a nice picture, shows us who the park is managed by, shows the address. If there's parking, you know, there would be a number of spaces here. And it gives us a phone number. It also gives us a URL where you can go straight to the park website. You can get to this park from Google using the Google API. Uh, there, I'm using their direction application, well, basically their direction API and passing that through. And then you can go to the reservations website if there is a reservable facility here. What will happen if you go to a park where there's not a reservable facility is this will not show up. The reservations website will, the link will not be visible. And this is running extremely slow. The other question we had, is there a downside to using a countywide park search? I can't think of one off the top of my head. The reason that I decided to go with the county, the full county, is when talking with some of the staff with Mecklenburg County GIS, Mecklenburg County Park and Recreation is just one piece of the park and recreation systems in Mecklenburg County. And since this could be used by citizens throughout Mecklenburg County, I didn't want someone in Cornelius to go onto the application and say, oh, well, I can't find any of the parks that are in the town that I live in. So I decided to include everything into the application, um, which meant going through and working with their parks departments to make sure that I had all of their data, adding it in to our existing data and essentially setting up protocols so that they could come to me with edits and letting me know what is changing so that I can make the change on this end. And it works really smoothly. I actually have it set up so they all have edit rights to the back end of the edit application and then I verify any of those and then push those through to the production application. So, you know, I, I wanted this to be inclusive and not you know, exclude anyone in the county. And as you would have it, the live presentation isn't working for some reason. I, I promise you it does work. <laughs> It is a Friday at 341. Maybe it just said it's almost five o'clock somewhere and <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I will, I don't know. One thing I will do is I have a filter over here and what this allows the user to do as well is choose parks by an activity. And I have a feeling this is just because it's, it's just spinning and it um, just not working. But in here, if, this were to come up, you would see basically like a basketball with an icon and then there would be a basically a radio button. And once you click that radio button, it will, the application will zoom out to the full county and turn on just parks that have basketball courts. And then you can go further and search on one of those parks and it'll take you to that park. You can also click on the park because I have everything in here is identifiable. I'm, I, I fear to click on it, but. One suggestion is to turn off your um, video and that might help. Okay. So that, so maybe give that a try. Let me give that a try here.
Let's, let's let me refresh here. You know, it may just not like going through Zoom. It's quite possible. Being like live, interactive. Yeah. Virtually, you know. Yeah, and, and being passed through Zoom, it just may not be enjoying that at all. Well, that's okay. Everybody can go to your link that, that you have up there and check it out and drive around and give it a little test. Yeah, so what's happening is... Um, it's not liking the unsecure connection through Zoom. So it's not allowing it to, to work properly through Zoom. Oh. At least you know why now. <laughs> Getting a lot of kudos. It looks really good. Uh, impressed that you GPSed it all. <laughs> nice work. Well, thank you. And this, this site is actually available up on Mecklenburg County, their park and recreation website. So if by any chance you were interested in checking it out, you could always um, just go to the Mecklenburg County website. Sounds good. Thank you so much. This looks like a great resource for your community and appreciate all the work you did to present for us today. Oh, you're very welcome. I think that brings us to the end of our symposium. I know we had uh, potentially some last word, last announcements, or might have went over them already at the beginning about our uh, I think conference Nancy's date. Do something. Okay, perfect. Yep. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself here. Uh, I just wanted to follow up and thank everybody for attending, especially to our speakers for coming forward and talking. It was some great presentations. Um, all of these presentations will be available on our YouTube channel. You'll get an email that will let you know that. And the last announcement I've got is, even though they talked a little bit at the beginning about the summer conference, uh, you will be getting some more information this week. We're going to send out an email with a save the date, and we're going to be opening up for calls for presentations and to start getting um, our sponsors to go ahead and sign up too. And we're going to do something very similar to what we did last summer. So that was, um, it went over very well and everyone seemed to enjoy themselves. So hopefully we'll make it even bigger and better this year. So go ahead and make sure you've re uh, save those dates and we'll be sending out an email message next week. And that's all I have. We've got a lot of thank yous and we really appreciate it. If you all need any other information, feel free to get a hold of any of us on the board and we're happy to help you with whatever we can. Hey, Nancy. Hi, everybody. Nancy? Yes. After this, uh, can you give me a call on my cell phone? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks, absolutely. everybody. Bye. See you soon. Great job, Jackie. Thanks, everybody. Great job. Thank you.